Well, I have a rather unusual background, I suppose, because in my earlier years, I did receive an MD from the University of Maryland, and then later I uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania and took a doctorate in anthropology. So I became a cultural, social type anthropologist, and I spent my academic career that way. I taught at the University of Wisconsin for a time, and then in 1972 I came to Hampshire College. And that was a crucial time for me because when I arrived at Hampshire, I found that students there had designed on their own a course on the Holocaust, one of the first, possibly the first in the country. And I was asked to supervise the course as the faculty member. I did that, and I learned so much that I decided I should be uh, teaching this this topic on my own. So I began teaching a course on the Holocaust. And very soon after that, I realized that in order to understand that subject, I had to understand a lot more about Jewish history. So I began studying European Jewish history on my own and soon was teaching that as well. So uh, to put it very briefly then, I have a, I have a triple background in the sense <laughs> that, that prepared me pretty well for this particular topic. My medical background, my background as an anthropologist, and my study of European Jewish history. Mm. And then about five or six years ago, I was doing some reading in European Jewish history. I had already published one book on uh, Jews and Christians in medieval Europe. It's called Abraham's Heirs, Jews and Christians in medieval Europe. And I... Uh, realized in reading this book just recently, about say five or six years ago, that I had not understood the role of circumcision in Jewish history and in Jewish-Christian relations. I had not understood just how important the entire circumcision imagery was with regard to how Christians viewed Jews, specifically Jewish men, of course. And I began to study that. And uh, it wasn't very long before I realized that I had a much, larger, a much larger subject on my hands, that this was not just a subject in European Jewish history, this was also a topic for American medical history. And so I began to expand my interests. And it wasn't long before I had encountered activists on the subject, uh, in particular Marilyn Fair Milos, the founder of uh, no CERC, mm -hmm. the National Organization of Information Resource Centers. And I contacted her, and I ended up speaking at the Sydney conference in December 2000. Mm -hmm. And that was really a transformative experience for me. By that time, I had begun working seriously on a book on this subject. And as I began to understand more about the activist aspect of all this, I began to think of myself as what I call a scholarly activist. <laughs> that is, I was going to do this book, and I was hoping that the book would make a contribution to helping people to understand just what circumcision is all about, and most particularly, why it's time for us to stop this. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I arrived at where I am now. And uh, uh, once I retired from teaching at Hampshire College, which was in 2002, I had a lot more time to work on this book, and so I was able to complete it. I had already started it. I was working on in summers in particular. Mm -hmm. But once I retired, I was able to, uh, to uh, continue with that. And so I was able, fortunately, to get the book uh, completed. And, of course, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing it appear. Yes. Yes. As you as you well know, this is probably the next to maybe a couple other issues in American society, probably the most sensitive of, of topics, mm -hmm. uh, an issue which stirs up a lot of emotions in people. And it's particularly sensitive, uh, of course, because it's it, the issue fairly unfairly has been associated with um, with Judaism. And so people are reluctant to talk about it in any uh, meaningful way because uh, people are afraid of being uh, being accused of of uh, prejudice or, or anti-Semitism, et cetera. And as someone who is, is Jewish, uh, to write a book like this takes a tremendous amount of courage. Um, I think most people would say that. So did you approach the issue from, from any degree of tre trepidation? Well, I think I understood fairly early along that this was likely to arouse a certain amount of anxiety and perhaps hostility from some people. But uh, I certainly don't look forward to that. I certainly don't want it. But I guess if that's what I have to deal with at times, then that'll have to be it. As I say, I certainly don't don't want to have to get, get into that kind of question. Um, I know perfectly well that many of my quite a few of my fellow activists are Jewish. Uh, 
And I've had so much personal experience with, uh, with, uh, with the activists in this field to know that anti-Semitism is simply not a part of their agenda in the least. Um, I think it's very important for people to understand. Uh, Jews constitute perhaps 2% or so of the American population right now. Depending on who's counted as Jewish, it's becoming more and more difficult to do that kind of counting. But mm -hmm. depending on who's counting, it's somewhere around 2%. Now, at present, somewhere around 57 or 58 percent, as near as we can determine, about 57 or 58 percent of American male infants are being circumcised in our hospitals. Obviously, the vast majority of children who are being circumcised in this country are Christian or Muslim or non-Jewish children. They are certainly not Jewish babies. So this is by no means a Jewish question alone. As a matter of fact, I think it can reasonably argue that this is far more an American question. If it is a Jewish question, it is a Jewish American question. Many Jewish children are being circumcised in hospitals just like Gentile children uh, with no ritual whatever. According to Jewish law, this does not have any effect or any, any ritual. This does not have any religious value whatever. And many Jewish parents, I'm sure, don't know this, or if they do know it, don't care. Uh, so that's certainly something that has to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. So I don't see this at all as a, a Jewish issue exclusively. I think that one has to understand the Jewish origins of this practice, mm -hmm. and one has to, uh, we have to try to understand how a Jewish ritual practice became medicalized and entered the American medical world. But that's quite different from saying that this is a Jewish practice alone. It mm -hmm. certainly is not. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get to this book, Marked in Your Flesh. Th that's, that's quite a provocative title. That title comes from Chapter 17 of Genesis, mm. which is the primary text that justifies uh, ritual circumcision for Orthodox Jews. Uh, in Genesis 17, his name becomes changed to Abraham in the course of that chapter. And the Lord says to him, I am El Shaddai. He announces himself by a rather mysterious name that uh, is not, not easily, easily identified now, possibly a Canaanite deity. But in any event, he starts off by saying, I am El Shaddai. And then he says, uh, walk in my ways and be perfect. Uh, and then he goes on and he speaks to Abram, tells him eventually that he's going to change his name to Abraham to signify his new status. And he tells him, he says, I am going to make you the father of many nations, and I am going to give you a very large land grant. I'm going to, I'm going to give you and your descendants a very large amount of land. And, uh, but then he says, but there is one provision here. I want you to circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Mm. And all of the all of the males in your household, your uh, your slaves, your servants, everyone, all males must be circumcised, and all of your descendants unto the generations must be circumcised on the eighth day in this manner. It's interesting to note that uh, when he uses the term flesh, what we translate as flesh, he says he says in that chapter that uh, this shall be a sign to you. It shall be marked in your flesh mm. for the generations like that. Mm. The word flesh in Hebrew is basar, and uh, it has a dual meaning of flesh or meat, but it also means penis. Mm. So the mm. meaning there is pretty clear. The other interesting aspect of this that I think ought to be thought about in connection with the same topic, that I said is Genesis 17. We look back at, at Genesis 15, two chapters earlier, we find almost the same story, the Lord appearing to Abram and making promises to him of the same sort, but there is no mention of circumcision at all. So we find two chapters, chapter 15, in chapter 17, with essentially the same story, but the second time, circumcision is being described. And the reason for that is that the Bible was put together as a series of texts from different times. And Genesis 17 was an earlier text. Genesis, uh, Genesis 15, pardon me, was an earlier text. 
Genesis 17 is what biblical scholars call a p-text. It was created by priests around the 5th century BCE. We use the term BCE rather than BC in Jewish studies Mm. to mean before the Common Era, Mm. the same time scale, of course, but it avoids the Christian terminology. Mm. So about the 5th century BCE, that story was introduced into the Bible, the story that gives rise to this marked in your flesh uh, imagery. That was created by priests long, long after Abraham is supposed to have lived. People who believe in the Abraham story believe that he lived around 1800 BCE. That story was added to the Bible, the story about circumcision, somewhere around 500 BCE. That tells us already quite a great deal Mm -hmm. about what was happening here. Mm -hmm. As to why the priests were doing this, why they instituted it at that time, that's a story in itself, and I don't know whether you want to go into all that at the moment. Well, the priests were creating at that time These were people who had just returned from the Babylonian captivity. They were rebuilding the temple again, the so-called second temple, and they were creating a patrilineal theocracy. They were creating a a, um, theocratic government to be ruled by priests with a very strong male emphasis. And the evidence that we have strongly indicates that they took the practice of circumcision, which was already known and transformed it into a ritual practice in which infants would be circumcised, male infants would be circumcised, as a sign not of the child's commitment to anything. How can an eight-day-old child commit himself to anything? But as the father's willingness, as the father, as the child's father's willingness to submit, as it were, to, to priestly authority. In, in the original form, uh, in many cases, the father himself did the circumcision, thereby, of course, endangering mm. his child's life, at very least endangering his child's genitals, mm. the source of all his hopes for posterity, sure. for children, for grandchildren, and so on. Sure. So uh, that, that very act in itself was an act of what you might call ritualized submission mm. by fathers. Uh, their willingness to damage their little boy's genitals as a sign of their uh, willingness to subscribe to the principles of this male-centered theocracy. Hmm. Uh, There's a very good book on circumcision called Covenant of Blood by Lawrence Hoffman, who is a rabbi, in fact, and a specialist in Jewish liturgy. And one of his major, one of the major themes in that book is that circumcision is, in effect, a profoundly sex, sexist right. It is, it is a right of male incorporation into a male world, and women have no, no place in it, not really. In contemporary times, <clears throat> many modernist Jewish Americans, of course, bring women in in various ways, but there's no escaping the fact that this is a male-oriented ceremony from beginning to end. It's ironic in a way that a male child is the one who suffers in order to promote what is in effect a sexist ideology. That's fascinating. It's interesting you mentioned his book because he, he, uh, that book, uh, he writes very eloquently about the history of the circumcision, but he doesn't come out against circumcision. Not really. He's very cautious. After all, we have to remember that Lawrence Hoffman is a rabbi. He's a professor of Jewish liturgy, Hebrew liturgy at the Hebrew Union College in New York. Mm. Uh, He took a big chance even publishing the book at all. If you read that book carefully in detail, I think you do find that although he does not come out against circumcision, he says clearly that when you look closely into the practice, what you find is not nice. Mm. He even uses the image at one point. He says, uh, if I remember correctly, I don't like to quote another author. I believe he said, when you turn up rocks, you don't know what you're going to see underneath. Mm. Mm. He used a metaphor very much like that in there, I'm pretty certain. But is this book written for a, for a general audience or is it written for a religiously inclined audience? 
know very definitely the former. As a matter of fact, I suspect that religiously inclined people may be rather unwilling to read it, or if they do, they'll probably do they'll probably do so quietly on the side and not talk about it. Mm. I don't know that, of course, <laughs> obviously. Right. But uh, no, the book is very definitely addressed to a general audience. Mm-hmm. Religion, really, in a sense, does not have to enter into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I certainly hope that there will be readers of every religious and ethnic type. I'm addressing this to an American audience. As I said before, circumcision is an American practice. Somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of our infants, it's very hard to get exact numbers here. We don't know because the reporting is not that accurate. But in any event, somewhere around 55 or more percent of American infants are being circumcised. And this is a book addressed to the American public, and I certainly hope that people of every kind will read it. Although I talk a great deal, as I explained in the beginning of the book, although I talk a great deal about Jewish circumcision, that's inevitable. It has to be understood how this ritual practice, ritual Jewish practice, ended up as an American medical practice. So obviously I have to I have to begin at the beginning mm-hmm. and follow the story through. But I do hope that if people follow me through, they'll understand why the book is structured the way it is. You know, I, I've... I've I've read and, and, and had people on the program in the past talking about this very issue, about how this uh, became a ritualized medical procedure. Many authors, a lot of authors, and you're probably one of the first, won't touch upon um, what they call the Jewish origins of this. Um, they kind of stay away from that mm-hmm. because uh, it, it is a very sensitive topic. In your book, explain in your view why, do you, uh, the, as you put it, the Jewish origins of this became a, a medicalized practice. All right. Uh, For century after century, the Christian world viewed circumcision not only as a distinctively Jewish practice, but as a distinctively repulsive practice. There can be no question about this. Beginning with Paul, who was not uh, who, who did not speak in harsh terms, but Paul in his letters, particularly to the Galatians and to the Romans, in, in his epistles, he very clearly said, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. That is, lack of circumcision is nothing. All that matters is life in the spirit, mm-hmm. and so on. And as a matter of fact, the image of Judaism as a materialistic religion, which has been part of Christian anti-Semitism almost from the beginning, is closely tied to circumcision as being a kind of uh, representative uh, image here as to the fact that the Jews are seen as being preoccupied with physical matters rather than spiritual. Mm -hmm. Now, I say I'm not stating this as my view. As you said before, I am Jewish. I'm not stating this as my view. I'm saying that this was and still is in many respects a Christian view of Judaism, the contrast between the physical and the spiritual spiritual or the material and the spiritual, something of that sort. But, but just, just to interrupt, it's very interesting we're having this conversation on this day right after Pope John Paul has, yes. has passed from the scene. So right. it, uh, there's lots of um, issues regarding religion and right. various religions. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Well, that image persisted throughout the centuries, really. Uh, Jews were, were um, uh uh, repeatedly described, Jewish men that is, and, and it was Jewish men who were always the image of the Jew. Uh, Jewish men were described as feminized, uh, almost castrated, weakened, and so on. And as a matter of fact, there was even Jewish writing that indicated some awareness of the fact that, in fact, circumcision does diminish sexuality. We can come to that more later. But in any event, that was the image for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Beginning around the mid to late 19th century, gradually accelerating in the second half of the century, we find that British physicians and then soon after American physicians are beginning to take an entirely, a radically different approach to circumcision. First, the theory is that circumcision is curative for various kinds of conditions. Perhaps the most prominent advocate there was an American physician, very prominent, uh, Louis Sayre, somewhere around the 1880, uh, during the 1880s, who began claiming that through circumcision, he could cure various orthopedic and even neurological conditions, spastic paralysis, epilepsy, you name it. Mm. 
Physicians at that time had a theory called reflex neurosis. They believed that what happened at the foreskin could, by reflex action, neurosis meaning neurological impact, could have an impact on other parts of the body. And that if there was something wrong with the foreskin, they could, that, uh, that, that they could uh, cure some other part of the body by taking off the foreskin. Mm. Well, they also used the term phimosis. Uh, phimosis came more and more to mean any child who had a nice long foreskin that looked too long to the physician. <laughs> it seemed as though it might be a good idea to sort of get that off. <laughs> After a while, they, as they began to understand better that they were not really curing anything by circumcising babies, the theory then changed from treatment to prevention. They then began to argue that they could prevent various conditions by circumcising babies. They then began to say, well, uh, yes, it may be true that we can't uh, cure epilepsy this way, but we can prevent sexually transmitted diseases, what they called venereal diseases. So what happened then, to sort of make the story short here, what happened in the late 19th century, first in Britain but very soon after in the United States as well, was that circumcision, rather than just being a Jewish ritual practice, which of course continued, Circumcision became medicalized. It became adopted by physicians in Britain and America as a medical practice. In fact, they be, some of them began saying that Moses himself had been a great proto-physician. They called him a great sanitarian. Mm -hmm. They said he understood. The, the, the belief was, of course, that Moses had written the Bible. Right, right. right. And that he understood what circumcision was really all about, that it could prevent diseases, and that's why he had put Genesis 17 into the Bible in order to get the Hebrew people, you see, to, uh, to circumcise their babies and so on, so as to prevent these diseases. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you find an interesting, what should we call it, confluence, a flowing together of Jewish and, and non-Jewish medical theory uh, the Jewish ritual practice being blended into American and British medical theory mm. so that they then begin circumcising, saying, look, the Jews have understood all along that this was a good thing to do. We should be doing it to all our babies. Mm -hmm. And at that point, of course, you have another kind of, of Jewish influence coming in, uh, you might say willy-nilly. The only kind of circumcision that these physicians knew about was Jewish circumcision. Now, let me step back a little bit and say something about that. Please. Jewish circumcision itself is a very radical procedure as compared with the way circumcision is done in many cultures. In most cultures, the foreskin is pulled forward and that much of the tissue is cut off. Is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing at all. It removes a great deal of highly sensitive tissue. But it is not as radical as the Jewish procedure and by default, as it were, the American procedure, as, as happens now. Because what happened was the only form of circumcision that those physicians knew was the Jewish form. Mm -hmm. That form had gradually evolved in the early centuries when the rabbis realized, we're talking, I'm talking, I'm taking it back now for a moment to back to around the first and second centuries. The rabbis realized that some Jewish men wanting to participate in athletic games were pulling the remains of their foreskins forward, what's called epispasm or what we now call restoration, pulling it forward in order to cover the glands because you could not appear naked with an exposed glands. Right, right. So they then instituted a new rule. Not only must the foremost part be cut off, but the remainder must be slit and pushed back and removed as well mm -hmm. so that the entire glands is exposed and nothing remains of foreskin tissue that can be pulled forward over the glands. Mm -hmm. That became already by the second or third century, that became the standard Jewish practice. There e there's even a separate Jewish term for that. The first part of the procedure is called milah and the second part is called priah. There's a a separate procedure. And just incidentally, the third part, sucking, that's called metzitzah. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a three-part procedure mm -hmm. uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. But in any event, to come back now to the 19th century, 
<laughs> the, by the way, always happened in the 18th uh, century. And, but what uh, I was uh, talking about oh, just sorry, then sorry. was quite far back, oh, right, second, right, century. second that, century. That procedure was instituted very early. Right, okay. But now coming back to the 19th century, all these centuries Jews have been doing that procedure that way, mm-hmm. that radical way. Mm-hmm. Now here are British and American physicians only able to see a Jewish circumcision if they want any kind of a model. And so what happened, as it were, was that the Jewish procedure, the Jewish surgical procedure, if you want to call it that, was brought into British and American medical practice. And that has persisted to this day. So in effect, that's what I think I said earlier, that uh, the, the, the surgical result of an American hospital circumcision is essentially the same as the surgical result of a ritual circumcision by a Jewish moil, a Jewish ritual circumciser. Uh, we're talking uh, with Leonard Glick, who is a former professor, uh, professor emeritus at Hampshire College. He is the author of a brand new book called Marked in Your Flesh, Circumcision from Ancient Judea to Modern America, soon to be published by Oxford University Press. A uh, very important book. Uh, indeed, on this issue of circumcision. As I mentioned, uh, I'm sure you've encountered over the years, many people will, will say, when, you, when we're talking about this issue, will say, well, you know, it's such a, it's such a little thing. Uh, you know, why, why, why the big deal over this issue? And, and reading your book and reading other books, and particularly your book, it's such a rich uh, history uh, on this issue and how this issue has developed and, and, and become particularly after World War II, mass circumcision of, of, of American boys and, 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 and youth. What, what I want to find out, and particularly when it comes to the 20th century, how did this procedure become such – how did – like at some point 90 percent of American boys were being circumcised. As, as someone who was circumcised myself uh, in, in, in the 60s, uh, I have a personal interest in this. Uh, but how, how – particularly after World War II – before World War II and after World War II, how did this this, this procedure become such an a, a integral part of American culture? Yeah, that's a difficult question, really. Uh, it's obvious when we look at the history of what happened in the 20th century, we see that there was a steady rise in percentage. Uh, I think that there, there are two main, two main possibilities to think about here. One is that in the early 20th century, uh, childbirth itself became medicalized. More and more women were giving birth in hospitals as opposed to giving birth at home. And so physicians became the persons who were in charge of childbirth and obviously in charge of the baby afterwards. So we find that instead of being put right into his mother's arms, the child is uh, scrubbed up and put into a bassinet and so on, all that sort of thing. So the very process of of medicalization in itself encourage physicians to intervene further so that we find that most uh, most circumcisions even now are being performed by obstetricians, by pediatricians, or even in some cases, unfortunately, by hospital interns who have never had any experience with the procedure at all. But in any event, that's one major, that's one major consideration. Another consideration apparently is that during World War II, there developed the idea that you could prevent sexually transmitted diseases by circumcising men in the military. And apparently, large numbers of men, I don't know of any specific statistics on this, but large numbers of men were circumcised in the Pacific and elsewhere by physicians who felt that if they did this, these men would be less likely to contract what were called venereal diseases, what Mm -hmm. we now call sexually transmitted diseases. So then you had the situation where a man ends up circumcised, whether in a hospital earlier or in the military, Mm -hmm. and then comes the idea, it was done to me, I want it to be done to my boy as well so that he will look just like me. Mm -hmm. The fact that you don't look like your father, that is like granddad, seems to have been forgotten somewhere along the line, and the Mm -hmm. notion that somehow or other it's a good idea for the boy to look like his father. 
Mm. Whether they believed that boys were staring at their father's genitals to, <laughs> to determine the, the size of their foreskins, I don't know. I don't know exactly what was the theory there. It's much more likely, obviously, that the it's much more likely, obviously, that the father sees the child's genitals, not the reverse. Right, right. But in any event, that's what happened. Right. A third consideration is this that I think has to be addressed. Jewish American physicians who became quite prominent in the medical profession uh, in, uh, in the United States early in the 20th century became definitely among the most prominent advocates for this procedure. Now, I deal with that at some length in my book, and I realize it's a very sensitive and difficult subject to deal with. Yes. But the fact is that certainly among activists, it is well understood that Jewish American physicians have been more prominent than average in pushing for this procedure. Now, am I suggesting or is anyone suggesting some sort of plot or conspiracy? Of course not. It's far more – history is obviously far more subtle and complex than that. Mm -hmm. And in understanding people's motives and understanding exactly how the dynamics develop, we obviously have to look deeper than that. Mm -hmm. now, now, clearly one possibility is that, as we know, as large numbers of non-Jewish children are circumcised, obviously the, the physical difference between Jewish men and non-Jewish men obviously disappears in that regard. So, ironically enough, what was intended as a distinctive Jewish mark, marked in your flesh, now becomes nothing of the sort. It becomes, in effect, a distinctive American mark. So, uh, it's, yes. difficult, it's difficult to know how important that factor was, but when you look at the people whose names appear most prominently in the history, particularly in the 20th century, Jewish American physician names stand out. Is that to say that Gentile physicians were not participating? Absolutely not so. Many Gentile f physicians were enthusiastically participating, joining, jumping on the bandwagon. Um, and, and there were certainly Jewish physicians then and now who have objected to this practice. Yes. What I'm saying is that among the small group of people who were the most prominent advocates, Jewish American physicians are clearly uh, quite noticeable. Mm. clearly predominant. Mm. So that has to be taken into account as well. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to know. It's, uh, one can't say that they were motivated to do this. I believe that these physicians, all of them, uh, were and are operating in good conscience and that they do believe that this is a beneficial practice. Mm -hmm. Some of them have argued, look, uh, in our Jewish tradition, we've long understood that this is a beneficial practice, right. but that's as far as they've gone. Right. And I think that's as far as we can go as historians in trying to explain uh, what was happening here. Mm -hmm. What we do know, though, is that as we move into the later part of the 20th century, America begins to stand out more and more as a circumcising nation. The British, the Canadians, well, from the very beginning, let me just back up a little bit here. From the very beginning, the only countries that really ever practiced circumcision in the Western world to any great degree were the Anglopho Anglophone nations, the English-speaking nations, mm -hmm. Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, okay. right? and the United States, of course. Sure, sure. Since... Uh, uh, since several several decades ago, really since the end of World War II and, and, and the period right after that, uh, the British came to understand, as a result of several key publications, they came to understand that circumcision is a medically unnecessary and harmful practice. They removed it from coverage in the National Health Service, and the rate of circumcision plummeted so that now we find uh, everywhere in the English-speaking world, the circumcision rate is well below 20 percent. In Britain, I think it's now down below 5 percent. In Canada, varies across the various provinces, but the overall rate is somewhere around 15 percent. Australia, 12 percent, and let me re and uh, New Zealand near zero, and let me repeat again: United States somewhere around 57 or 58 percent. Mm. So we see the difference. So mm -hmm. rather strangely, whereas the rest of the English-speaking world has a, has begun to abandon circumcision, mm -hmm. we seem to be holding on to it with remarkable 
insistence. Yeah. And as I said, in the Europe on the European continent, Germany, France, Denmark, Sweden, Italy, so on, an extremely small rate, somewhere down around one, two percent, if anything. And many of those are Muslim children. One, one, one thing you do talk about in here, and also, and we mentioned earlier, um, about about the different um, reasons for circumcision right. um, that, that that were that were given for this, and and which caused this mass uptake in circum in the, in uh, circumcision here. I mean, earlier on in the last in the last century, early part of the last century, we had to deal we dealt with masturbation. Um, yes, that's a topic <laughs> I didn't touch. In fact, I right. should have really right. said that right. one of the major motives. In the, 19, in the late 19th century was the belief among physicians that circumcision would discourage masturbation. It does not. It mm -hmm. makes it more difficult, but it does not discour discourage masturbation. Circumcised mm -hmm. men know this perfectly well, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. um, one more point I did want to bring up, Shelton, with regard to the 20th century, and that is that as these new theories developed about what circumcision was good for medically, this in itself promoted Yes. The advance of the rate. Yeah. Uh, in particular, the belief first that it was uh, prevented for cancer of the penis, then that it was prevented for cancer of the prostate, then that it was prevented for cancer of the cervix. Yes. All of these have been discredited. And then, of course, we know that more recently, as those theories were discredited, we get the new theories, the urinary tract infection, and AIDS, HIV AIDS, both of which, both of which are highly questionable when you come to a cost-benefit analysis and ask, it, are we justified mm -hmm. in circumcising these millions, literally millions of infants? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is clearly no. The, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has stated now that there is no medical justification for doing this routinely. Mm -hmm. Let's talk uh, about another aspect of this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you mentioned in your book, and uh, that's the, you know, and not just the cutting of, of the penis by a knife or anything. It, it, there's a specific machine and specific tools that are used to, to uh, take the foreskins away, and you talk about the Gomco and the, Mo and the Mogan clamps. This this procedure is to any other thing would be seen as just totally barbaric. Yeah, well, what happens to to the, that part of the body and it, the, the how it's crushed and, and twisted and, and squeezed out, et cetera? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, these clamps uh, were incidentally developed by Jewish physicians or moils, ritual circumcisers. Mm -hmm. The uh, Gomco clamp and the Morgan clamp are the two most commonly used. There are others as well, but those are, are two of the most common. Um, they do indeed crush tissue in various ways. Mm -hmm. You have to look at a Gomco clamp to fully appreciate what this thing does when those screws are tightened mm -hmm. with that clamp in place, just how much pressure. There is one article that describes how many thousand pounds of pressure this applies to that infant foreskin. Uh, the Morgan clamp is a simpler device that clamps over the front part of the foreskin so as to avoid cutting into the glands, but it still crushes tissue. Then the, then the, then the surgeon um, cuts with the knife across that. But these are, these are crushing devices, and uh, when, we, when we remember that the foreskin is the most sensitive part of the male genitals, the most heavily innervated part of the male genitals. When we, when we keep that in mind, we can get some sense of what the infant feels when that exceedingly sensitive tissue is crushed that way. Mm -hmm. I might say uh, with regard to that also, Shelton, that many physicians to this day do not use any anesthesia. Mm. Some certainly do. Many do. Many mm. do use local anesthesia, mm. which has limited effects for a limited amount of time, although the pain may persist for days. Mm -hmm. But no one, I think it's fair to say that no one is using sufficient anesthesia to fully offset the pain and, and, and certainly the damage that's done by this procedure. Yeah. yeah it, absolutely. Um, the... And you have a chapter, another chapter in your book called Unanswerable Questions, uh, Questionable Answers. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Explain a little bit about that because there are so many questions and the answers you get are 
leaves one puzzled out here on this issue. Yes, in that chapter, I think I begin to deal more with some of the difficulties that uh, Jewish Americans have in particular with this procedure because it's come down as the idea that this is a tradition that must not be abandoned, that somehow or other Jewish identity depends on it. And I think that's what I meant there. I try to discuss some of the some of the people who have uh, written to try to deal with this question, and I try to show that although they are very competent people, when they come up against this particular issue, they find it very difficult indeed to deal with. Uh, when you really look clearly from the Jewish point of view at the question, why must we continue to circumcise our infants? What exactly is this contributing to Jewish American life, to Jewish American survival, if people want to use that term? Uh, that's a very difficult question indeed. For one thing, we know clearly that uh, tens of thousands of Jewish American men who were circumcised, whether ritually or in hospitals, uh, are not practicing the religion, are not attending the synagogue, may be intermarried, and so on. So there's no evidence whatever as far as anyone can see that that circumcision in itself is going to influence a person's sense of Jewish identity. We have to remember also that uh, Jewish women are obviously, fortunately, not genitally damaged, and they seem to maintain their Jewish identity quite well without, without infant genital surgery. Right, right. So in that chapter, I try to deal with various ways in which people have tried to understand this question, have tried to work their way through it, and I quote on both sides fairly extensively because, to be honest, I do believe that anyone who reads the arguments as presented on both sides will reach the same conclusion I have. Mm. But, of course, readers are free to reach their own conclusions, sure, sure. and they're also free to go back to the text that I read and to uh, read them more completely. You talk about it in popular culture. Um, when this issue comes up, particularly on television, et cetera, people make a lot, you know, it, it becomes a very humorous issue. Um, there's a lot of right. jokes about it, and uh, there's it's, a lot of mirth is made around the issue, but no one, I, I, I think people, at least I see, people are very afraid to, to, to deal with this issue, so they, they deal with it in a, in a more of a general humor way. Right. Um, why, why is that? Why do you think that is done? Well, I think we can we can pretty well guess why it is. After all, we're talking here about the genitals. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking here about sexuality and mm. talking here about a procedure that damages sexuality. Mm. And certainly the kind of anxiety that this generates, I think that whenever we see humor being being uh, uh, focused on a particular topic, it seems always legitimate to ask, is this humor being used to offset anxiety? And I think it's fair to say that that's the answer here, that there is anxiety about this issue. There is discomfort. Many people don't want to discuss it at all. Uh, when you do discuss it, it does raise a certain amount of discomfort right at the beginning. And one way to get around this is to use uh, humor, although I find the, the jokes, although I record them because they're interesting, mm -hmm. I find them singularly unfunny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I might just mention that on National Public Radio, the program Fresh Air, yes. uh, uh, Terry Gross interviewed David Gulliher, uh, who's author of an important book called Circumcision. Sure. Um, and uh, she interviewed him at some length. Then she followed that interview as in characteristic fashion. She followed that interview first First, with a short interview with a Jewish ritual, ritual circumciser, a moil, mm. and then she brought someone on to tell Jewish circumcision jokes. Now, I wrote to her mm. and asked her, I said, do you think this was really appropriate? Uh, right. I said, suppose the subject was female genital cutting. Mm. Would you bring someone on afterwards to tell jokes about this? Right. Right. Well, of course, the answer is no. It's a, it's a, a most unpleasant practice and something that we're all opposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I received no answer to my letter. But uh, I think that that gives us a clue that when we uh, when we find people repeatedly making uh, jokes about a subject, this must be a topic about which there's some anxiety. Obviously, this attaches not just to circumcision alone, sure. but to sexuality, Absolutely. the so-called dirty joke. 
right. is obviously an indication of some discomfort with, with discussing sexual matters. There is the idea here then that removing the foreskin somehow perfects the baby. Right. You remember I said that in, gen- in Genesis 7, we have to be careful, Genesis general here, <laughs> Genesis 17, right? right. Uh, the Lord says to Abram, walk before me and be perfect. Right. Uh, and the word perfect in Hebrew, tamim, has been interpreted as meaning not perfect in behavior, but that your body needs perfection, right. that, the, that the foreskin uh, needs removal in order to finish off the baby or perfect him. Well, as we say in some of the signs that we hold up for physicians to read, the foreskin is not a birth defect. Right. It's a product of human evolution. It's there for a very good reason. Mm-hmm. And removing it is no more perfecting the body than would be removing the eyelids. Absolutely. Before you go, and you are a physician. and you, uh, you're med- uh, Well, I have medical training. Man, training. I do not practice as a physician. Okay. Though, but, <laughs> yes. but, I, but I also want to talk to you uh, partly uh, about this as, as a cultural anthropologist. There are women who say that there's a difference in, um, and it's some, a lot of this is anecdotal, a uh, difference between American men and, say, European men. That, to be, to be perfectly honest, that's the kind of speculation that since I prefer to remain the historian <laughs> and the anthropologist, okay. I'd rather not make. I don't like to speculate psychologically in that right, way, to right. be honest, because sure. I don't know the answer. Sure, sure. Uh, I think there, there, uh, we do have some, some anecdotal evidence that European men encountering circumcised American men are rather uh, disturbed and perhaps perhaps disappointed to find that there's no foreskin there, that there's something missing. Mm -hmm. That's not quite the same thing as the question you asked me. Uh, Obviously, when you talk about uh, uh, the character of a large number of of people like American men, obviously there are all sorts of social, cultural, psychological factors involved, and obviously American men are all not the same kind in any event. So I don't see how we can attribute Uh, any particular psychological characteristics to circumcision. Generally speaking, um, I I should say that generally speaking, I avoid psychologizing about the effects of circumcision. Okay. The claim that it causes this, that, or the other, I just don't see the evidence for that. Okay. And I don't think we need to go there because the argument against circumcision seems so powerful and complete without that kind of speculation that I simply don't, uh, don't turn to it. I, I, I hear you. Let's uh, close out uh, this interview, and uh, I, I hope that I hope that people really will read your book because this is a very important book. Uh, well, I hope so too, Shelton. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, what, what's your the uh, uh, final thought, uh, a final uh, imprint you would like to share with the listeners about uh, about this issue, and particularly about this book? What What do you hope this book will accomplish uh, to people, for people? I hope that this book will help people to understand how circumcision came to be an American medical practice, and I hope it will, uh, it will help them to understand uh, why I believe that this practice is not only unnecessary, medically unnecessary, but very definitely harmful to infants and to adult male sexuality, and therefore also to the sexual experience of their partners. So I'm hoping that if people have a historical perspective, if they have a broader perspective on how this came to be, whether those people be Jewish or Gentile or whatever, that they will see that in our modern enlightened world, there is no place for damaging the genitals of male or female infants. Uh, Leonard Glick, I want to thank you very much for being here on Walden's Pond. It's a very important book, and I hope people definitely will, like you said, will, 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 will read it. And you've made a, certainly a very important contribution to this issue on a very, very important and very sensitive topic. Hopefully one day we won't have to talk about it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank you here for being here on, um, on Walden's Pond and sharing your, your ideas. And again, the book is called Marked in Your Flesh, Circumcision from Ancient Judea to Modern America by Leonard Glick, Professor Emeritus at Hampshire College. Thank you again for being here. Well, thank you, Shelton. It's been a privilege for me to be to be here and to speak with you.